I'm going to start over and introduce our speaker. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience with this. So I, I'm really thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Ashley Hopeberg, who's an assistant professor in American Studies um, at the University of Notre Dame. And Professor Bird is a Native American game designer, PhD in Native American Studies. She's Western Abenaki and originally hails from the Champlain Valley of Vermont, sort of nearby, yes. sort of. Um, and her 2021 UC Davis dissertation um, has, is on its way to being in, turned into a book. The dissertation was titled Representation and Reclamation, the History and Future of Natives in Gaming. And we were really thrilled to bring someone here who's sort of pushing us to think broadly about digital scholarship and at the intersection of Native American studies, indigenous studies, gaming studies, and digital scholarship. Um, Bird, as I mentioned, is currently working on a book manuscript tentatively entitled Dead, Red, sorry, Red Dead Redemption, Finding My Place in the Digital West, that explores the complex relationships that different players have with games and undertakes a, an exploration of Red Dead Redemption series. I think we'll hear about this today. But I, I just want to mention also that beyond her academic writing, she's created three artworks, um, publicly exhibited several times in group and solo ex exhibitions, and she has curated one show, and among these are two of her original video games, One Small Step and Full of Birds, um, which have figured, have been featured in, in digital space at the Imagine Native Film and Media Festival in 2018 and 19, respectively. <coughs> She's also a fan, founding member of the UC Davis, Davis Mod Lab, uh, an experimental laboratory for media research and digital humanities, and there's a lot more to say about her. The last thing I'll just mention, um, is that she's also working with the Bonana Creek Heritage Center to help develop a digital museum featuring elements of Abenaki history and culture. So it was all of these things that made us so excited to hear about your research today. Thank you for putting up with the technical for everyone, and we look forward to hearing about your work. So please join me in welcoming you. And thank you, Tara. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Hope Bird. I'm Western uh, Beneke, um, and I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Um, so my talk, talk is, is called Performative Pasts and Speculative Histories Playing in and with the Digital West in Red Dead Redemption. Um, so the, the way that I want to open this talk is actually talking about stories, and I think the greatest overlap between video games and the American West is that they are both this kind of space for storytelling. Um, but the West is really formed off of what Soraya Murray calls consensus memory, and it's this highly constructed and agreed upon perception of that period. Um, and this consensus memory, though, is one of the majority, and it influences many of the stories that we have told and that we still tell in games about the West. Um, and that's also just true about the stories we tell in games. It's a lot of this kind of consensus um, memory that is uh, based on the majority. And in games, oftentimes, the story and the stories we tell seem to become the rules for our players. Um, so as scholars like Jewel, Delion, and Salen, and Zimmerman have discussed, rules in games are explicitly different from rules as we understand them in the physical world, right? When we talk about the rules of a game um, in digital games, we are often really talking about the game's mechanics and its actual coded construction. And the example that's often given is that mechanics are like the laws of physics. They are immutable, involuntary, and largely ignored or taken for granted, right? They're not something we really pay attention to or notice when we are playing. But these rules can become conflated by players with social rules and cultural constructs in and around games. Um, Everett and Watkins state, quote, more importantly, they demonstrate the degree to which game developers are moving toward recreating culturally specific and racialized environments that are packaged and marketed as authentic expressions of the social world, end quote. And so it's no coincidence that, you know, one of the first ever iterations of Native Americans in games established this set of rules that would not only mimic how white men, violence, power, women, and Native Americans are imagined in the West, but how their stories would be told and what rules they would abide by in games as well. So a little bit of a trigger warning here. We're going to look at Custer's Revenge, which uh, has a rape narrative. It is a very awful game, but it's important to look at. So this is Custer's Revenge. This is basically the first ever depiction of a Native American in a video game. So this came out in 1982 for the 20, uh, Atari 2600. It was made by this company called Mystique. Um, and it was released under their Swedish erotica series, which was 
adult games, basically. And so this is the original packaging for the game. And if you look at it, it has all of these taglines like, quote, remember, revenge is sweet. Every time Custer scores, he comes up smiling and right back for more. The higher the score, the more challenging the game action gets. Um, but what the game game action really is in this game is featured in this screenshot up here. You play a general Custer who is nude except for a hat and boots and has an erection. And the whole point of the game is to dodge these arrows and get across the screen and rape this native woman whose name is Revenge, who is tied to a cactus. Right. So this this uh, representation immediately establishes a narrative of violence against indigenous people in the digital space of games. It's violence against women. Um, and it centers the agency, violence, and power of the white male in both the game space and the space of the West, right? It's perpetuating this narrative of the Custer myth and valorizing the last stand and all these things and the conflation of indigenous women's bodies with the land. Um, when Mystique went under as a company, another company called Play Around re-released this game and titled it Westward Ho. So it's now this like Manifest Destiny style narrative. It's hugely problematic, um, but it's kind of set the standard for a lot of the rules we think about in games. The stories and rules of games have encouraged specific types of behavior and certain roles for marginalized characters and players alike. Thus, the rules have historically also taught players that Natives are the bad guy, women are hypersexualized objects um, of consumption crafted before the male gaze. Um, black characters have often been associated with criminality in game spaces like CJ and um, uh, GTA San Andreas, Franklin and GTA 5, Lee in The Walking Dead. Um, this is a picture of Melina from the Mortal Kombat games. All of the women in those games fight in bikinis or something similar. Um, and when games include different roles or different rules, for women or characters of color or LGBTQIA2 characters, when they try to tell a different story or in the eyes of some gamers break these rules, the response is often vitriolic. Um, and sometimes breaking the rules in the game means punishment outside of the game itself. Um, so a good example of this is this character of Abby from The Last of Us 2. Um, her character is definitely not built for like the male gaze. She's not a hypersexualized object. She looks like she actually survived an apocalypse. Um, and at the beginning of the game, she kills the straight white male protagonist of the first game. Um, and, you know, totally fine if you hate her as a character, but this is screenshots of the threats in real life that the voice actress who played her received after she played this role. Not that it matters. Laura Bailey doesn't look anything like the character she portrayed. But, you know, it's this incredibly vitriolic, hateful um, response to this character who breaks a lot of these rules. Similarly, the character of Ellie in the second game got a lot of hate because she's uh, openly gay in the second game, which she also is in the first game. But a lot of people don't pay, pay attention to that. because She's a child in the first game, but she's an adult in the second game. Um, similarly, um, the actress Bella Ramsey, who portrayed Ellie in the Last of Us television series, um, got a lot of criticisms of not being hot enough um, in reference to the video game character, which is deeply problematic because she's portraying a 14-year-old girl. Um, so a lot of these kind of responses to the breaking of these rules that women are supposed to have in game spaces. Um, this also applies to Native American characters, right? And it, it kind of really shows us what games have taught players about indigenous characters. So this is a screenshot from the map of Red Dead Redemption 2. If you look at this little white circle around the Wapiti Indian Reservation, that only shows up at two places in the game. It's on the Wapiti Reservation for the whole game from the beginning of the game. Um, and it's on another town called Rhodes in the third chapter of the game. So what this circle indicates is that within that boundary, your character physically cannot unholster his weapon. You cannot participate in a violence within that space. Um, the reason that it happens in Rhodes in the third chapter of the game is basically the gang that you are a member of is trying to run a scam on the town. So your gang leader has been like, don't cause trouble in Rhodes because we don't want to get found out. So you can't do that for a small amount of time within Rhodes. Um, but any other town in the game, you could go in and you could, if you wanted to, you could just start like shooting NPC characters willy nilly. 
but there is NPC law enforcement. So if you start doing that, they will very quickly make your life difficult, right? They will come try to kill you. They will come try to arrest you. The more violence you participate in, the higher your bounty is. They will chase you all over the map. It becomes a pain in the butt to do that. The Wapiti Reservation doesn't have NPC law enforcement. So if this wasn't put in place, you could theoretically walk in at the beginning of a game and kill every single one of them and nothing would happen, which doesn't make sense because they're really important to the story in the latter third of the game. So why did Rockstar do this? Why did they institute this boundary around the Wapiti Reservation? Nothing in the game is telling you that they're bad guys. They don't engage with you in any violent way. Um, you're not supposed to kill them. Um, but it's because of responses like this. There are so many people online who were furious that you could not go into the Wapiti Reservation and kill people. Um, went onto the Wapiti Reservation and discovered you can't use weapons. You can't shoot kids either. That's a whole different issue that this person is having. Um, so are Indians a protected class in games? Bet Rockstar was terrified that SJWs would say they support genocide or something. It breaks immersion, all of this nonsense. But people were so upset by this that they couldn't participate in the normal rules of a Western, of what you're supposed to do to natives in digital spaces, that they took the time to find workarounds of how to get around this mechanic so they could still kill the Wapiti. Um, and there's there's like YouTube videos of people explaining how to do this. It's a real issue. Um, and this isn't the only example of this kind of continued narrative of what players think native people are in the digital space of games. Another good example of this is this game called This Land is My Land, um, where it's an open world game where you play, the protagonist is a Native American man that you play as, and he's supposed to be essentially like resisting colonialism. And this is from the Facebook group of this game before it came out, where it's very clear that he is supposed to be the good guy. This is user responses. This is a fake ass Red Dead Redemption. Spoiler alert, your whole team loses. What if I don't want to be a wagon burner? Can I be a cowboy? Is there a smallpox DLC? Can't wait to scalp women and children. This is players understanding of how indigenous people operate in the digital space of games. These are the rules for them, right? So these perceived breaking of the rules of telling other stories that the majority players seemingly don't want also hints at another thing players want and have become really used to in games which is control. Um, so the way that I kind of started getting into this idea of like control and player agency was in discussion with my students in the class that I teach about games. And we have a whole unit on genre. And for the last couple of years, when I asked them, okay, so like, what's an RPG? Give me examples. They'll list Red Dead Redemption, The Last of Us, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. None of those games are RPGs. They're action adventure games. They're not role playing games. Um, and so I was like, why do they all think that these are what R RPGs are? I don't understand what's going on here. So um, what an RPG actually is, is basically it's a game without a protagonist, right? You create the protagonist. Everything about the character is from you. Um, you have to have you know choices that matter. Um, even bad choices or self-destructive choices can be valid. You have to, um, it's usually very expansive, so you don't ask the, the player to track the plot alone. All these different things kind of make up an, uh, an RPG. Um, and so I was like, what, what is happening here? And I think some of it is, in the last couple of years, analog role-playing games have really kind of shot to the mainstream with things like Critical Role and The Adventure Zone and Dimension 20 and Dungeons and Daddies, which is um, not a BDSM podcast, as they always say. Um, so these, these shows boast casts of these like really talented voice actors, writers, and other prominent creatives who've been involved in games and media for a really long time. Therefore, the role playing in these shows is second to none, right? There's dynamic voices, complex characters, original compelling stories that drive the show and drive the fans to them. But in the world of digital role-playing games, the idea of what role-playing is seems to have changed dramatically. Um, role-playing in its analog form often means creating a character from the ground up. Like I said, everything about them. However, role-playing in digital spaces has come to mean something very different. It seems that gamers want to tell stories in digital spaces, but they want to tell their own stories. Um, all they see when they watch something like Critical Role is the story happening. To them, that's just how it plays out. They don't participate in any of the mechanics. There's no randomization in dice rolling for them. That's just, oh, 
That's how the story went, right? They're not experiencing any of that. So they think that games will follow these traditional game rules as well in the digital spaces. Um, but that's not how real RPGs work, right? So I think Baldur's Gate 3 has produced this really interesting phenomenon to demonstrate to us that players want control in digital spaces even when it's with an actual role-playing game. So Baldur's Gate 3 is an actual RPG, a digital RPG. Um, when the people found out that they don't have ultimate control in this game, they hated it. Um, and disclaimer, I think you should play games however you want and however it makes you happy. However, people started playing Baldur's Gate in a way that it was really not designed to be played. They started participating in this thing called save scumming, which I will show you a little video of. Lenny check. That's harsh. We're fine. We can do this. Uh, well, you know, I'm out of spell zots, but if I knew there was a tech here, I would have rested and used like Owl's Wizard or whatever. So I'm just going to reload. Now we are you, uh, you know, Shadowheart has guidance and she's not here because I thought she wouldn't be relevant to this quest. So, uh, I feel like it's unfair to lose because otherwise I would have like a, a D4. It's, I'm just gonna, now we're, are you fine? Fuck it. I'll just use my inspiration and. Are you? I failed it all? Fine. I just want to say scum. Fine. What? This is my reward after everything? It just looks uglier now? You know, I should just be honest and stick with the first result, right? Right. So, what, what save scumming is to explain is basically having before some kind of important interaction or like um, combat or whatever, you make a save file so that if it doesn't go the way you want it to, you can reload it and try again, right? But the thing with RPGs, both digital and Baldur's Gate, as you saw, is this dice rolling mechanic, right? It's randomization. Failure is supposed to be an option. It's supposed to be an outcome, right? Um, you're supposed to be like, well, you did not persuade that guard and now he punched you, so figure it out, right? Um, but people didn't want to do this. So they started, like, this is the uh, huge phenomenon around Baldur's Gate 3. So much so to the point that Larian Studios, the company who made the game a couple months ago, released an honor mode, which is a way to play the game where the game physically prohibits you from having more than one save file. So it was like, if you want to play Baldur's Gate the real way, play in honor mode, like the way it was meant to be played, essentially. Let me check. Um, That's harsh. So, um, Players' desire for control breeds a particular type of gameplay. Um, digital games kind of convey us the agency of others, but do those agencies really matter, right? Because to players, the NPC doesn't matter. You can save scum as much as you want. It doesn't matter. Um, they don't have any agency. Whereas in analog games, like if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons at a table with your friends, you can't just re-roll the die because it's inconvenient to you that the roll didn't go the way you wanted, right? Because the agency of the other players matters, right? It matters to them, it matters to you, it matters to the story, it's the social contract you have participated in to play Dungeons and Dragons. But in digital spaces, that's not what players are used to. That's not what they want, right? Um, they are used to having failure, but failure isn't the end result. Players want to be involved in the telling of the story and they want the <laughs> illusion of choice, right? They want it to seem like their choices will have branching outcomes, but instead they will be this kind of linear guaranteed desired outcome ultimately at the end. Um, failing is something that often, often happens to us in video games, but it's not supposed to be the end goal or the ultimate result, right? Usually it's sometimes of like, oh, I failed that mission or I, I I got killed or whatever, so I just try again. And that's the point is you try again and you get past it. But with these types of RPGs, that's not the point. Failure is just part of the game, right? So players don't want RPGs in digital spaces. They really want me RPGs, right? They want it to be all about them, the story that they want to tell, and they want to have complete control in these spaces. So going back to Red Dead Redemption, how does this all relate, right? So Red Dead 2 is this game that came out in 2018. It's this kind of epic Western um, it's, it's it was insanely successful. Um, went over to, went to, on to sell over 17 million copies in the first two weeks that it was released. Um, the launch set records for largest ever pre-orders, largest first day sales, and largest sales for the first three days in the PlayStation market. Also received a lot of like critical and consumer claims. Uh, acclaim. It's really really highly rated. But more importantly, control is tied to the space of the American West and the stories that get told there, and the control over them. Red Dead 2 came out and proceeded to create a game that told the very performative stories that players wanted. 
while maintaining the real rules, keeping their story centered, keeping them the white male, straight white male protagonist as the main character, the only one with agency, and the real control they desire in the space of the game, the space of the West. Um, and Red Dead exemplifies that stories that get constructed are often performative, and the rules really don't end up applying to these characters at all in the same way that they apply to other characters, right? So the rules that were kind of set for women, characters of color, um, get very, very aggressively enforced, whereas the rules for the straight white male protagonist are very, very flexible. And so a good example of this is this uh, gameplay video. Uh, I'll show you a little bit. Nope. I'm loaded. I come with me? I'll show you how we hunt one. Sure. Why not? Mount up then. Let's go. You know, it was before my time, of course, but my mother used to tell me stories of how her tribe moved with the bison. They lived almost as one. The bison went, my people went. They were the center of all life. We couldn't survive without them. They provided us with everything. Food, clothing, shelter, tools. There was a lot of respect. Huh. I don't remember much of my childhood, but I think my people, oh, we pretty much moved with the whiskey. <laughs> well, my father did that too. Let's try over here to the left. Over there. You see them all? Incredible, aren't they? We should only kill one of them. I'll keep them ringed in and you see if you can bring one down. Okay? Clean as you can. So, before I skip to the next part, basically what happens is you kill a bison and you harvest it. And then Charles sees a bunch of dead bison that have been just killed and left there. Um, and he gets really upset about it and wants to figure out where they're coming from. Um, who, who has done this? Um, I'm about to catch up with you later. No, I skipped it. Sorry. Kill him. A family. Yes, we did. We shot them bison. We'll shoot you too if you don't get. What business is it of yours? What we? Oh, oh. It's not business of mine. Oh God, you're crazy. I got a family. A family. Don't shoot me. Stand back, Charles. I'll get you some answers. Well, what the hell are you doing? Why are you killing those bison and leaving them to rot? I don't know what you're talking about. God damn it, tell us who did. And make it look like it was Indians. Just kill him, Arthur. No, please don't kill me. I'm begging you. All right. <laughs> so it glitched a little bit there. He says that basically the government hired them to kill a bunch of them and make it look like it was Indians. Um, but regardless of whether the player chooses to kill or spare the remaining poacher, the message is the same. You, as Arthur, have now learned to responsibly hunt buffalo. In addition, you have not only saved some of the buffalo from needless extinction, but also aided the local Native American community to whom the bison are so important, including your friend Charles here, um, saving their food supply from being diminished as well as saving their reputation. Arthur, in this moment, shirks his role as colonizer and instead becomes a hero for the environment and for Native American communities. Uh, his actions, or so the game would indicate, effectively slows the vanishing of Native resources and thus of the Natives themselves. All in all, the scenes ends up with a sense that it is a redemptive situation for you playing as Arthur and the surrounding Native nations, right? While Charles may have indicated to Arthur that the bison are to be treated with care and not to be overhunted, both through his encouragement to only kill one bison and to take and utilize every part of it, as well as through his condemnation and murder of at least one poacher, um, the actual mechanics of the game do not support or enforce this native and conservation friendly idea at all. The rules are very different. Not only does absolutely nothing happen to Arthur as a character or to the progress of the player if they continue to hunt bison after this conservation message mission, but instead the game mechanically encourages you to actively do so. Um, if one examines the mechanical functioning of the game alongside the broader narrative, 
um, that is forwarded, there are some serious discrepancies to be to be found in the messages that players are being fed via these two modes of engagement, play and narrative. Um, or the story and the rules. These discrepancies are discrepancies are not limited to this interactive scene alone, uh, but are a much more pervasive element of the game. Ultimately, the occasionally native-friendly narrative that is dispatched by this game um, disguises a deeply colonial mode of play in Red Dead 2 that involves the player in all too familiar narrative of Western conquest. Um, so Red Dead 2 works very hard to portray itself as the epitome of the revisionist Western. Um, revisionist Westerns are a subgenre of the traditional Western that can be largely traced to films made in the 60s and 70s. It's diverted from the pre-established canon in favor of narratives that blurred the lines between the good guys and the bad guys. The genre also made more uh, uh, attempts at more nuanced and accurate renderings of women, um, people of color, um, while also serving to discredit, thank you, um, the stereotypically glorified white male protagonist. Um, so Red Dead 2 works really hard to try to say, this is a revisionist Western. The rules are different. We care about women and people of color and the environment and violence isn't always the answer. But that turns out to not be true at all. Um, this genre also made, um, oops, in this specific regard, Red Dead 2's narrative would have the player believe that this is exactly the end they are pursuing. A native community is narratively forefronted and mechanically safeguarded, as I talked about with the Wapiti. Primary members of the game are women and African-American, and the game's morals and actions are often brought into question. However, if we interrogate the structure of the game beneath the surface level of the narrative, it quickly reveals that the inclusion of minority populations, namely native characters, as well as specific narratives surrounding the frontier are nothing more than empty virtue signaling. Red Dead 2, um, in the, it, while it would be difficult to argue that Red Dead 2 is an unsuccessful game from either a design standpoint or its kind of positive reception from fans of the series, it still has a lot of problematic narratives and gameplay mechanics um, in addition to constructing an open world that often fortifies like segregation, misogyny, and manifest destiny. Um, games really have this ability to allow players to embody a position and a narrative um, that would be precluded to them in the real world, right? They get to play the hero in this game. And Western games provide a historicized, neatly manicured version of the West for players to kind of live out their cowboy fantasies. Um, uh, it's very, it's supposed to be very kind of realistic. That's the whole point of the game. You can do everything from like change Arthur's clothes to shave his face to like, if you don't take a bath for a while, NPCs will comment on how filthy you are. Um, but this power both inside and outside of the digital domain of the game is reserved for a select group of individuals, namely straight white men. And Arthur Morgan serves as the interlocutor between the narrative of the developers and the desires of the uh, consumers. Um, while digital representations can and often do embody current manifestations of humankind and their desires, they also have the ability to um, allow players to change their position and embody a different kind of narrative. Um, but Arthur has very specific rules for himself that other characters within the space of this game aren't, uh, don't have access to. So throughout the game, both narratively and mechanically, Arthur and subsequently the player can do no wrong. They're casted as the hero in the broader Western story, ex um, exuding like white male privilege. The narrative feature is, com this, this kind of narrative feature is commented on by many of Arthur's fellow gang members, most notably and most frequently by Bill Williamson, who's the fellow in the plaid shirt, um, uh, and Micah Bell during a story mission in which Bill, Lenny Summers, and Karen Jones request Arthur's assistance as the vault man to rob a bank in Valentine, the mission's opening dialogue reveals the gang's thinly veiled contempt of Arthur's exceptionalism. When Bill confronts Arthur about getting in trouble in Valentine before they could, uh, before they could rob the bank, Arthur claims that it wasn't his fault and it was just one of those things. Um, instantly, Bill gets really mad at him and he says, scoffs and replies quote how come every time i get in trouble i'm called a fool and an idiot but when you get in trouble oh it's just one of them things standing nearby lenny and karen both are like that's a good point that's a really good point um clearly indicating that bill isn't alone in his assessment of arthur's privilege this narrative exposition points directly to the manner in which the game design undercuts any revisionist style narrative even though the story makes moves to account for people of color um, native presence um, women, conservation, the vanishing, the vanishing of the outlaw in the Wild West, 
Uh, play mechanics tell us otherwise and instead ultimately place a straight white male character, uh, a protagonist, and the player controlling him in a manifest destiny style quest to conquer and consume a digitized West with no significant repercussions. Um, the representation and also just the, the representation of people of color in this game, which, you know, I think is kind of a box checking to be like, look, we're a revisionist Western, we're being inclusive, is just that, it's box checking. The representation of African-American populations within the game lacks any kind of depth or deep, deeper engagement within the story, other than to draw attention to racial diversity within the main cast of characters and the world at large. Um, this is a very minimalist, very self-serving method of representation. And there's also physical segregation in the game, like black characters live in only very certain parts of San Denis and basically the bayou, um, and the, the indigenous community is entirely relegated to their reservation. Um, there's also a lot of issues with the way that this game represents women. Um, um, so I just want to scoot, scoot forward just a little bit here. So in this game, the player gets to participate in a performative task, right? The, these kind of sham missions ultimately give way to the centering of player control and the reifying of the Western fantasy. Um, through a number of missions, the player gets to try to help the Native American population, um, but it kind of comes to naught and the player gets to blame the military or the corruption of the oil industry or their corrupt gang leader, not the reiteration of the tropes of the Western world that they want, which is exactly what's happening, right? These examples all signal the game developers half-hearted attempts to assuage the guilt of the player for their own participation within these systems of oppression within the game world, while still continuing to recreate them and provide a world where the white male protagonist and subsequently the player controlling them can continue to live out the Western fantasy of their dreams, where they can continue to have ultimate control in these play spaces where their agency is the one that is centered and the one that is that matters the most. All of this other forms of inclusion um, were the mechanics to follow up on them would simply get in the way of being able to live out this kind of cowboy fantasy. Just like Dutch and his quest for Tahiti, a speculative futurity based on an imagined reality, the developers want to create a digital West where their players can feel good about having aided in the tragic fight of the vanishing uh, Indian that was alas to no avail, while Arthur's journey largely follows a fantastical narrative about a world that he and Dutch constantly complain no longer wants outlaws like them, the world that John Marston and subsequently the player are rewarded at the final, uh, the finale of the game is the image enshrined by Frederick Jackson Turner in his long-sighted and highly problematic thesis. Um, ultimately, the narrative of the disappearing West um, in this extremely vast open world game is an optical illusion. It is a myth that makes the player hungry for the colonial narrative that they are being fed, and it is a myth that only certain peoples are privileged to believe in, to have a little faith in, and to reap the benefits of. So the idea of the religious Western, even with proper mechanics and more equal, equitable representation, will it be a contradiction in terms, do you think? I think a little bit if you're like creating a physical, the physical space of the West, right, as we imagine it, because that was a space where actual, you know, colonization and removal and all of these things happened. Um, so I think it would be really difficult to create an image of the American West, or at least like the way that the American <coughs> populace understands it, that wouldn't be inherently contradictory to what the revisionist Western is trying to do, right? Um, and this game does like all kind of moves to like pretend that it's doing those things. It even has a morality, like a, an honor system, like a meter that changes based on what you do in the world, and it means nothing. Like the story ends the same way, regardless of if you're high honor or low honor, right? So like. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't feel confident you can create a Western that actually does what the revisionist Western claims it's trying to do. Um, at least not in a game. Yeah. Okay. So I really want to know your thoughts on Assassin's Creed Three. Oh. Yeah. Yes, because Connor is, I mm -hmm. believe, the very first indigenous main protagonist of any video game. Not of any video game, but of a AAA game. Okay. Yeah, because um, there was technically Turok, but we don't know about oh. him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it, playing Connor, he's one of the more 
more peaceful, soft-spoken main protagonist, but what I noticed was in all of the marketing, he is just portrayed in the most violent manner, like yep. that tomahawk. Like yep. Yep, he, um, I think I have complaints about the game as well in terms of like the way they portray him and the choices that they made, but that is one of the things that I consistently point out is the way that they marketed Connor Kenway is, so before the game came out, um, Ubisoft, like if you get the like collector's edition of games, they come with these little collector's edition statues of the characters. Connor's is the first and only collector's edition statue where the protagonist of the game is participating in an act of violence. He is bludgeoning a British soldier to death with his tomahawk in the collector's edition statue. It's also the cover art for the game. Um, and after the game came out and you played it and realized that Connor's actually kind of a soft-spoken fella, not really problematic. I mean, they're all assassins, so they kill people, like that's a whole thing. Like that's all of the protagonists in this series of games. But he is no more inclined to violence than any of the other protagonists in these game series. So you know that after the game comes out, uh, he won an award for best character and game designers are nerds and they make these little like um, digital shorts of like their characters accepting awards for their games. And they made one of Edward Kenway, who's the protagonist of Assassin's Creed Black Flag. He's a pirate and he's a criminal by nature and he's supposed to be a distant relative of Connor on his British side, on his father's side. And he gives this whole like, we're gonna go and we're gonna take the award for best action adventure game and all of these things, and he's got like a sword. And then one of his like crewmates is like, we already won the award. And he's like, what? And so he like throws down his sword and he's like, he goes to put on a tuxedo and go to a party. And that's the whole thing. Connors is him saying, I am the victor, my heart soars, thank you. And then he just picks up the award and absolutely murks a bunch of British soldiers and like smashes one of their heads in with it and doesn't even take the award with him. So even after the game comes out and we all know who Connor is, he's still portrayed as this like the savage native man, like this hyper violent portrayal of him by the company who made him. And I do not think that is an accident in terms of their marketing mm -hmm. of him um, because he is very distinct from the rest of the characters and the, the way that they marketed him. Mm -hmm. And to follow up on that, because I have an anecdote related to that. Because um, when the game came out, it, so I think it was 2023, the following year, um, in my program, there was one PhD student, he's from Monkey. He made himself the Connor costume. He put it on and he walked around Colonial Williamsburg. Uh -huh. And Colonial Williamsburg, again, has very strict rules about, like, if you live around here, don't go jogging because we don't want to break the immersion and the illusion if you live here. I mean, how dare you? Yeah. 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 And, they, well, they couldn't do anything because he's literally a guest there. Yeah. And he's just walking around. He didn't try to climb any buildings. Oh, well, I heard he tried. He did. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, the, the climbing mechanic in that game is also racially distinct, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, with the, the tree climbing. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, white people can't climb trees. Uh, <laughs> you guys didn't know that, according to Assassin's Creed 3. Connor can, because he's part Indian. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, yeah, but it, it goes back to your initial point with, so bringing in the idea of that magic circle and bringing the digital world out into the real world and some of those cultural, uh, social consequences that you were talking about. Um, just wanted to tell you that story because I yeah. thought it was so fascinating, but could you elaborate more on that between the digital and the analog realm? Because what I see with a lot of living history museums, they're a kind of augmented reality, mm -hmm. right? Um, so their, their depiction of certain histories I don't, I think, would fall in line, and you could probably make some of the same arguments with how those depictions are are on screen or on in the in di digital game, video games as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's kind of exactly the case that like this game in particular is not trying to create a real version, like the his actual history of the American West, right? It's just trying to import the image of the American West that we have had in media for the last century, right? Like of every Western film, every Western piece of literature, Western photography, like all of these things. It's just trying to do that in a game space and recreate that exact thing. Um, it doesn't have any interest in, in like disrupting 
that that narrative or that that image. Um, so yeah, I think and, and like the way that things kind of you know between the analog and, and the digital um, and, and some of the problems that you have from recreating these types of of uh, spaces or ideas in the digital world is it reinforces like lots of game study scholars have talked about how like games basically just create a digital environment for actual culture to live in, right? Especially when it's online games and when you're participating in a community experience. So one of the problems with this game is um, it had an online component. It had, has an online component, Red Dead Online. And especially when the first game came, when the when the game first came out, um, there were all kinds of problems with people basically. Um, cosplaying racism, well, well not cause, cosplaying as the KKK in digital spaces and participating in historicized, like historically accurate, it was their understanding of it, racism against black players in this space because the game is set in like 1897 or something. And so you had all of these instances of players dressed in all white with posse names like the Grand Wizard, just unrelentingly hunting killing black players, hanging them off of bridges with the lasso, like, because to them, it would, and their response was, it's historically accurate. That would have, that's what would have been happening at this time in the West, right? So it's not just like, oh yeah, players would have this Western cowboy fantasy. It's like, this is what they understand the West to be, and this is how they think they can behave in the digital recreation of it, right? Um, and you see, you see a lot of that in game spaces that um, there's this like, at the same time, this like recreation of what they understand the real world to be, but also like wanting to disconnect from it with when they engage in bad behavior, they then give the narrative of like, well, it's just a game. It doesn't matter, right? It's just a game space, right? Which is what you see too, like several years ago, a popular streamer PewDiePie got caught using the N-word on a live stream and somebody tweeted about it. And one of the responses to that was, I don't understand what the big deal is. He's just using a gamer word this complete disconnect that it has any real world consequence or meaning, right? Which of course it does, but that, you know, it's okay to participate in those types of behavior in digital spaces because they are somehow separate from the real world. And again, it's this player agency. It's like what I want matters. I'm supposed to have complete control in this digital space. It's not supposed to affect anybody else because I'm used to playing with NPCs and they don't matter, right? It's not NPCs. Just because you can't see the person on the other end doesn't mean it's not a real person, right? Um, so, so I think it's, yeah, these like, you know, the, the relationship between the analog and the digital here is, is, is like really fraught and really, again, we need to be more conscientious about the spaces that we create in these, these digital spaces that we create because they are teaching and encouraging a particular type of behavior, right? Um, and then you next. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just wondering, like, thinking about, I guess, what's like one of your central arguments that the game mechanics are really at odds with this like narrative diversity in this game. So I was just wondering if you, if there's like another example of like how the game mechanic reinforces the traditional like rules, um, and also if you have an example of a game where the game mechanics actually um, like break the rules or like encourage um, the players to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So another example of this one, which I kind of alluded to at the end, is basically through this whole game, Dutch, the gang leader here, um, who's a real piece of garbage, is just telling you about how like the American West is disappearing. There's no place for outlaws anymore. That's why we have to leave America and go to first it was like Australia and then we gotta go to Tahiti or whatever. Always trying to escape because there's no place for us here anymore. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a prequel to the first game. So there's a whole other storyline that takes place in the digital west. It's not closed off to you. And even in the epilogue of the game, you end up as John Marston with $20,000 in his pocket in 1890, or the early 1900s, and he gets to build his cute little homestead with his wife and son, and then just run rampant over the digital west. A whole new portion of the map opens up to you, and the Wapiti are completely gone. They've been completely removed. Their reservation is empty. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Right, so the game is like, the whole story is like, we gotta get out of here, there's no place for us. The game mechanics don't tell you that at all. Um, a game that I think breaks the rules or has the mechanics like, hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think some interesting ones are like, 
like Undertale does that, right? Like it it presents itself as this like traditional style of play where you're like, oh, I'm just like fight the enemies, right? You do not have to do that at all. You can do a complete pacifist run where you don't kill anybody, right? So it, it it's not so much breaking the rules, it's like setting up a genre and setting up this digital space that we're all familiar with and then being like, pick. <laughs> and you can pick to not follow the traditional rules of that play space, right? Um, so I think, I think that one is, is really interesting. Um, one that breaks the rules, um, uh, it feels very self-serving, but my first game that I made was an experiment in this of like, how can, can you make something that looks that where, where it's the opposite, right? Where it's like the mechanics are actually kind of undercutting the narrative in a way that's like pushing back, um, which my first game is like this space walking simulator, kind of playing off of the idea of the space is the final frontier and the colonization and whatever. And it looks like an open world walking simulator. You just walk around or whatever, but very quickly you realize there's nothing for you to fight, there's nothing for you to collect, and your exploration is not free or unaccounted for. Eventually you will go and do so much that it will change the environment completely and then you'll just get a message that says colonization complete and the game just quits on you. Because you, ch you can't go back, you, you changed it. You, it. It is forever changed by your what you're doing in this space, right? So um, so yeah, I think it's game interesting when games have like those options for you to take different paths or participate in a different way that are not just like, you know, this is how, I, I think Portal does a good job of that too actually, like it takes the, mechanics of a first person shooter, and it's not at all for violence. It's just for puzzles, which I think is fabulous, right? Um, it, it's, it's very much pushing back on the, like, everything about that game presents itself as your typical first person shooter, the way it controls, the way it looks, um, but it doesn't, that's not the point at all. So I think that's, that's a really interesting example of that kind of happening. I thank you so much for this talk. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm uh, just to, to give some context. I'm a postdoc here at, at Brown, and I have a um, interest in American history, uh, the intersection of capitalism, and indigenous studies, native history, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not native myself, but uh, you know, I actually, but I was playing Red Dead Redemption while I was writing my dissertation. Oh yeah. On on the late 19th century, like the topic of my dissertation was on the late 19th century. I was playing this game at the same time. I was sort of reading a bunch of stuff about that time period. And I agree a lot. I think I agree a lot with, with what you had to say about it as a kind of sort of mantra of that um, time and space. And yet, at the same time, I, I also feel like there are things that it does that, at least in terms of the sort of like, um, yeah, a kind of like middle ground between simulacra and historical, mm -hmm. historical fiction that I was I had never seen before in a game, right? Um, and I wonder then also kind of along those lines, if what your feeling is about players who experience this narrative in a kind of um, pseudo role playing space where you have mm -hmm. some agency and some choice, and yet you're still also following a structured narrative, how would you respond to players that experience the story not as a heroic narrative, but experience it as an uncomfortable one. Mm -hmm. And I think also one that like, is made me uneasy all the way throughout as I was playing it. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and, I, and I wonder whether, that, whether that's the intention of the game or not, I don't, I don't know. And I wonder if there's, a, if there's a space there, potentially along the lines of the end of The Last of Us 1, yeah. right, where the player is sort of forced to do a horrific thing, and it's like in that moment, at least as I'm playing, it feels like it feels horrific, and I feel I feel bad, and the and I also um, go through a process of like disidentification with the player or with the character in that moment, mm -hmm. where there are moments in which, as I'm playing as Austin Morgan or whoever, and I'm doing things in the game, I am doing them. And perhaps it's shaping, shaping my subjectivity in this space, but I'm also, uh, I, it also feels bad in mm -hmm. the process too. And I wonder what you, what you, if you, if, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you interact with these players who have had similar experiences, and whether that shapes your, you know, sort of overall interpretation of the game. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so first to, to touch on the like the kind of historical narrative that's yeah. happening in the game. So my first book is about this game cool. um, and my like personal experiences with it. And I actually think some of the representation of the Wapiti in terms of like the narrative about their conflict with the United States military and that the military is like withholding vaccines from them yeah. and doing all these things to try to like bait them into conflict and all and like also being paid by an oil company because the reservation is resource rich, right? Like those are all like they did a good job of that. And in my opinion, it's then completely undercut by the fact that like they have to lose at the end because they're in the way for the next game and for Arthur and whatever. But you try so you can feel good about it. Yeah. Um, but and so that for me, like as a player, I was like, ah, so there's literally nothing I can do. They're just gonna die. Like awesome. Um, there's nothing I can do. But I think you know, even some, even though some players will have that feeling of uneasiness, the ending still you still get to be the like. That's why I said the the morality system literally doesn't matter because. Mm -hmm the differences in the good ending versus the bad ending of the game are like one line of dialogue. Mm -hmm. And Arthur, instead of the bad ending of the game, Micah will stab him and he will die. The good ending of the game, he kind of like, Micah beats the crap out of him and then he like dies on a cliff overlooking the sunset. <laughs> like, it's, it's, the difference is so minimal and they both feel redemptive because at the end, regardless of the choices you make, he still acknowledges the bad things he did and that he tried to be better. Right, so you still get to have this feeling of like, oh, like the game is still kind of saying he's the good guy at the end. Whereas I think the example with Joel is really interesting, right? Because you as a player can understand why he did what he did, but then he lies to Ellie at the end and that's very uncomfortable. Yeah. And boy, does he get his, his uh, karma in the beginning of the second game, right? It actually happens. There is actually a consequence to what he did. Whereas, you know, even if it, kind of um, even if Arthur didn't like participate in all the bad things for the latter half of the game, um, he would have died anyway. He had tuberculosis. Like he was he was done for after the after the third chapter of the game. So it kind of has this feeling of like, well, it doesn't really matter what choices you made or what choices he made. It was all going to play out the same way anyway, right? Whereas the second Last of Us game is very much telling you that like. If Joel had made a different choice, he probably wouldn't have got killed at the beginning of the game, right? Because it's, um, for reference, it's the the daughter of the man he killed is Abby, is the one who comes for him and kills him, right? He killed her father in, in front of her, and she has it out for him. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. I think you see players exert the most like agency in this game in terms of those, those who feel um, unsettled by uh, what you're supposed like what you're participating in are the folks who like don't go around massacring NPCs just because you can, right? Mm -hmm. Or like, uh, especially in online play, um, you know, uh, my posse and I like never start conflict with anybody ever. Like ladies don't start fights, but we can finish them type of deal. Like if people mess with us, then that you ask for that. But like we don't go out of our way to like, you know, mess with other players in any way, even though the game mechanics really want you to do that. Like, Player versus player interaction is how you get XP and money and all these things, but we're like, well, that feels mean, like, right? Um, so it's kind of, I think it's more players bringing their own morals into the space, and that's why they get affected, rather than like the actual morals of the digital space itself. I think those are very clear and have a very, like, very specific kind of path for you, but there are, of course, some players who want to come into these spaces and be like, well, I don't want to kill everybody, right? Like, um, but I think the majority of folks are like, cool, I can do whatever I want. Like the first game has an achievement called Manifest Destiny, which you get if you kill all of the buffalo. So right, there's a very specific world that it is trying to invoke there for a particular audience, which I think is why there are some players who are outliers because maybe they're not that target audience, right? They don't, it doesn't necessarily align with what they want to do in that space. I actually wanted to bring it back to the point about rule breaking mm -hmm. and ask your thoughts on rule breaking and as a method for decolonization. And because especially with these triple A RPGs, mm -hmm. um, 
like I never finished Red Dead Redemption 2 because I just spent my time going around trying to find fishing spots. Oh yeah, um, I picked so many flowers. Now. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm still playing as a white man moving through space, mm -hmm. like taking in resources. So to what extent is that kind of rule breaking, which that, that, that's sort of besides exploiting glitches and some of the mechanical controls, like you, you can choose your own style of play within these big games, but there's only so much mm -hmm. that can take place, and it's not really decolonization. No. Um, so so what, are, what are ways, what are games that, that actually engages in those methods, decolonization? Um, well, I mean, I think there's a lot of like, indigenous made games that are interested in very different things like um, for example like this game because it's an open world game right you're just the environment is a space for you to create and play and it's a space for you to consume right you can hunt all the animals you can loot all the things whatever um, it's it, it doesn't it doesn't affect you it doesn't matter we're done uh, it doesn't it doesn't affect you in any kind of conceivable way right like you don't have to have a relationship with the land or the physical space in any other way than like it is for me to take from um whereas if you look at something like never alone which is a game, a game made by the uh Inupiaq community of alaska uh is the cook inlet travel council got funding and they partnered with this game company to make this game and they are involved in like every step of the game development process um and it has this beautiful um, mechanic where it does have tr more traditional cutscenes, but it also has these things called cultural insights that you unlock, and it's these little documentary style clips from the community talking about the things that you are seeing in the game. One of them is talking about the land, and they talk about how um, the land has a soul, they have a relationship with it, it is like it has agency, and not only do they just talk about that, it shows up in the game. The game is a puzzle platformer, and if you're not paying attention to the way that the wind is blowing, which you can see, like, it'll pick up the snow and blow it in certain directions, you can't make certain jumps. You have to be conscientious of your environment all the time, or you're not able to move forward in the game. You have to be conscientious of, like, the ice breaking beneath you when you're walking on ice flows. Um, there's these, like, spirit elements that are, are, are spirits of the land that you... Uh, have to interact with in very particular ways, right? Like only the fox can interact with him and the, the young girl, Nuna, can't. And so like you have to manage that relationship. Like if you if you get her up on one of those like spirit platforms and then you have the fox go, like if you're playing with another person and you have him go way ahead of her, it'll just be your fault. Like you have to be like really conscientious of that relationship building, not only with like the physical space of the game, but the other player that you're playing with, right? Um, so I think there are games that, that do, uh, do things like that. Um, there's a game by Nathan Powell's Lions called Hold My Hand, which is so beautiful. And people are often confused when I say that because it's like very simplistic, polygonal little like characters. Um, but the game is about like actual relationship building and actual cooperation, right? Like a lot of co-op games now are still like inherently competitive, especially if they're online spaces, they're like super competitive and can be very toxic. This game is about these little characters that have to hold hands to get over, to, tra to traverse puzzles, right? Um, he coded the game so that the controls for each character are mapped onto one half of the same controller. So you actually have to like hold hands with the person that you're playing with. And you have to talk to each other and you have to build a relationship. You have to pay attention to each other. You cannot, like even if you're paying, playing a co-op round of Halo, like if I'm, I'm not good at Halo, this is a not true example, but if I'm playing with Tara, I, I can completely carry us, right? Like she could ostensibly stand there and not do anything. If I'm good enough, I could win the match for us, right? You cannot do that with this game. You actually have to cooperate. You act, and I think that's a really interesting decolonial move to like, it's not pitting people against each other in this competitive way. It's not about, I, I killed more people or I did better even though we're playing on the same team, right? It's like, you have to do this together. There is no other option. Um, so I, I think there's quite a few games out there that are doing kind of different things in the way that they're using mechanics and uh, utilizing space. Um, um, yeah, so I think there are some that kind of do, do those moves for sure. I could list others, but yeah. Can I, I mean, these are such amazing examples. And so, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a gamer, so I'm listening to all of this thinking like, 
how, why can't we fix this? You know? Yeah, yeah, great so question. Is, is the answer just capitalism or? Yeah, we'll learn this fall. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's usually the answer. Um, but I mean, these sound fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so, but what is it about the, I mean, we were talking earlier today about how expensive these, these kinds of games are and, you know, cinematic and this, this entire industry was. I'm assuming the games we're talking about now are, you mentioned one about a grant, about grants, or, yeah, know, right? Small. And so is it is it just that no one will play them unless they're already interested in the project of decolonizing game spaces, or? Um, no, Never Alone is a great example of that. That game won a BAFTA. Like, it, okay. it was really well received by players and critics, right? It's, it's, it is, a lot of it is capital. Game companies are incredibly risk averse, mm -hmm. right? Red Dead Redemption 2 from production to distribution cost $540 million to make. That is an absurd amount of money. They cannot make a game like that and hope it goes well, right? Like they need to know that players are going to like it, right? That they've done enough things of, okay, it's an open world game, it's a third person shooter, it's a Western. All of those things have specific rules and regulations for what those should look like to players, right? What they understand those to be. If you diverge too far from them, people are going to be unimpressed. Um, and and I think a good because again, you remove this, you remove this control. So you started with that, right? And I, I think a good example of that is like of of when it goes poorly is if you look at the Mass Effect trilogy. Um, so those games are also story-based games with branching dialogue where you can make dialogue choices. And more than Red Dead Redemption, those choices do matter. Like you can make a poor choice and like one of your squad mates will die in a cutscene and they are dead forever gone. Like that, it's a real bummer. Um, but your choices also carry over between games. So when you load up the second game, it taps your save file from the first game and knows the choices that you made. And those are still true in that second game. And it has quite significant consequences but it's a trilogy, and it's also a game about the apocalypse, so it had to end. Um, and in the third game, there's no falling action that you get to participate in, which you do as the in the narrative of the first two games. You get to make choices right up until the end. The third game, you reach this climax, this like pinnacle, you make a choice, and the rest of the game is a cutscene, and it just plays out. People were furious furious that this was this was not what this was not the you know they had been sold a false bill of goods right this wasn't a mass effect game they wanted more choice they wanted more control one person got so mad that he sued bioware the company that makes the game that case was quickly thrown out um but 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 it also affected their sales for for um mass effect andromeda and stuff it was people were like the ending of that game was such a disappointment so much so that the company released a huge free DLC for the third game to be like, we're sorry, where you could like have more interaction with your squad mates and have these like nice little bows on the ends of all their stories. So um, it's, I do think a lot of it is, is capitalism and a lot of it is also um, the nature of the industry in terms of who it is, um, uh, who it is accessible to and also who it is like hospitable to because as i mentioned before like we had the whole blizzard thing that happened a couple years ago where it was found out that not only was there rampant sexual harassment happening at their company they were actively covering it up right and so when you have a space that's not hospitable for women or people of color like you're gonna have the same group of people making the same types of games this endless feedback loop right so so I think there has to be changes, which is why, again, I think game studies is so important of teaching people that like, these are cultural objects, they matter, they have real world effects, they teach us things, they, you know, um, teaching students that of like, don't fall for it and buy the same exact Call of Duty game every two years that literally is just set in some other country. Um, <coughs> whatever, if you like Call of Duty, that's fine, but they really are cookie cutter copies of the same exact game. Um, so don't, don't, you can ask for different things. You can want different things. You can want different ways of playing. You can want different characters. You can want different stories. And when people get those different stories, they like them. Some of these really small indie games have been incredibly successful. I mean, Never, look at, like, Never Alone, Journey, um, uh, Papers, Please was pretty successful. Um, Super Meat Boy is like one of the best-selling indie games of all time. Like, um, you know, so I, I really think 
there is possibility, especially in the age of digital distribution where you don't have to pay somebody millions of dollars to ship your game to Walmart or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do think a, a good chunk of it is capital and being very, very risk averse. And, yeah. could, could you go back uh, to the slide with this nasty social media stuff? Oh, yes, indeed. This is poor Laura Bailey. Yeah, I just thought this was so. Uh, this one? Or is it the one about no, I think it's the next one. This uh, one? Yeah. Uh, so this is what I thought was really funny. I mm -hmm. mean, you, you've got like the kitten picture. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> the guy with his wife. And, you know, it's like, uh, it's kind of the discontinuity struck me. Like, Tara, I'm not yeah. a gamer, but, uh, and I'm old, so, you know, but. Uh, I thought that was just hilarious that, uh, you know, this is a kind of, uh, you know, can't wait to scalp women and children. Uh, you can, can, yeah, like, yeah, no, I, it's a really great point. There's this weird, people have this, like, they are doing things that have real world effects, and they're taking ideas about how to behave in these spaces from the real world, right? Like, they've got this understanding of who Native Americans are from other Western games and from Western film, whatever and they bring it into the game. Um, but then again, like what happened with Red Dead Online and the racism, it's seen as like completely separate. It's just a game. Like I can pretend to be a Klansman in Red Dead Online and that doesn't affect anybody. It doesn't have real world effects because if you read like Kashana Gray's work where she talks about the experience of black gamers, um, uh, especially over like voice chat, she talks about like voice profiling and how black players are considered deviant in, in digital spaces. And she does, and she did really amazing interviews with a lot of these people, and most of them will tell you, well, no, I would never use that word in real life. They they know that, right? Like they are aware that if they said that to someone in real life, it wouldn't go great. But they feel because of anonymity, because of the perceived rules and norms of these digital spaces, which get reinforced by by these types of games, by the fact that a lot of the majority participating in these you know chats is a particular audience, um, they get told that like, well, they can they can do that here. That's okay in these spaces, but it's not okay in other spaces, right? Um, yeah, it'd be I would be quite surprised if you walked up to any of these people on the street and they were openly rampantly racist, right? I, I doubt that they are, but zero consequences here, apparently. They, they clearly have a very different self-image. Exactly, ways. exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, the cat is hilarious to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can you, well, anyway, just following that thread, like, can you click on Eric Molson and Big Andy and see what else he's, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that, yeah, that idea of this is an exceptional space mm -hmm. where you can do things. And I'm trying to think of, a, I don't know, Halloween is one place where? Uh, red facing in Red Dead Online <laughs> is huge. People love it. There are Facebook groups get dedicated to playing as Native Americans, the Native American tribe, Native American warriors, like all of these things where people make specific character models. Because in Red Dead Online, you can create your own character to try to look Native, and then they play together in a particular way. Um, invariably, they're all shirtless men um, wearing some form of buckskin pant. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it, it's like so bad, and you have to laugh, because it's just like, what are we doing, right? But, but again, they're like, but would those people, in 2024, I mean, of course, there still are some people, but would those people in 2024 dress as a Native American for Halloween, right? Or would they put on blackface for Halloween? Probably not, because we're like, yeah, it's not great. Yeah, so it, it, you know, that really strikes me as, it, it's not just happening in the game space, though. This is bleeding over into all of cyberspace, yes. right? Yes. And yes. especially yeah. X, yeah. and, you know, what's formerly known as Twitter. Um, and all those spaces where people really feel empowered mm -hmm. to be uh, awful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think a lot of it is, like again, I said, like the how we understand these spaces to operate and who they're for, who they're serving. But uh, and some of it, and this one, this is a little interesting because I'm like, that's like your actual Facebook page. Right? Yeah. Just <laughs> saying that out loud. I'm like, you guys remember that we can click on that, right? Um, but like with X or like in game spaces where over chat and stuff where it's like I'm only seeing somebody's gamer tag and like 
they are anonymous to me, right? I can't, and you know, the um, regulating of those spaces is incredibly difficult too. Like I can report somebody to Rockstar and the server and like, probably nothing is gonna happen, right? <laughs> like, um, and, and then you have, uh, in spaces where there's text chat, they're use, starting to use AI to like filter specific words or block specific words, or like you will get an auto ban if they see a specific word. But in spaces where it's voice chat, like you can't police it in the same way, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Games are awful and wonderful, and I'm not gonna say Well, you have actually given us some wonderful stuff. Yeah. Did you have a question? I have one final question yes. about the broader counts of things. So you started the game like for instance Caster's Revenge, I yes. think was the name. And back then and now when you look back at it, it's, it's obvious that that game should have never existed. It's right. wild, it's disgraceful, and instead of those, now we have games like more and more games like Red Dead Redemption, which seem progressive, but like when you sort of like look deeper into it. They are not as progressive as they are, but they have much larger farm bases. Uh, they are in the much larger economies and whatnot. Uh, so when you compare where we were with where we are right now, uh, concerning these farm bases as well, where do you think we are headed for the first thing and second thing? Is it still like, what would you say to someone who would say something like, it's still better that we had Red Dead Redemption rather than Custers, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would also make that. I mean, it is. It is better, right? It is better that a game company doesn't think that they can make that game, right? Because there was this like immediate backlash to Custer's Revenge, and like a lot of stores refused to carry it. But it also got this huge cult following because it was so taboo. And somebody in the early two thousands remastered the game and made a new version of it with updated graphics and updated mechanics that like floated around on the internet for a while, right? So like it didn't go away. It was awful. But, so I do think it is better that we have games like Red Dead, because like, as much as I bitch about it, I do love Red Dead Redemption. There are a lot of things that I really like about it, right? But I'm still in that weird limbo of like, man, there's also a lot of things that are really, really badly, and it encourages this really bad behavior. Um, so I, I think, you know, what, what do we, we do about this is like, I was saying this earlier at our lunches, that like, that is why I think game studies is super important and should be a part of every curriculum for people who are trying to make games, right? If you are in a game design program, you should have to take game studies classes. You should have to understand that these things have real world consequences, right? That there are other options. Look at all these vast variety of games that you could make that do different things. And even the, you know, the award winning ones, the really highly rated ones, people like this. You can make different stuff. Um, and I think there's just that huge, huge disconnect between um, um, like consumer and industry at this point. Um, and, and that there, there could be such a better relationship. Like if, if game companies would respond, if every company would respond to player complaints the way that like the people who make Baldur's Gate 3 do, I'd be like, yes. Because those, I don't know if they are never sleeping, but they are releasing a patch every single week because one person was like, a Starian shirt disappears in this one weird dialogue, and they're like, on it, like, fix it. And I'm like, it doesn't, not, it doesn't affect the game at all, right? But, like, their players are saying, this is an issue for us, and they respond immediately. Um, and, and I just don't think a lot of companies are, are that interested in it, because, again, it's about the dollar, right? They sold the game, you bought the game, you're on your own, right? You got what you got. Um, so I, I really do think there has to be this emphasis on, like, teaching people who are making games that these things are important and they have effects and that they outstrip the film industry by billions of dollars globally every year. Like it's it's um, insane how popular they are, how, how many people play games. Um, so I think getting, and I think some of that also comes from like also getting folks um, to not simply view games as leisure objects anymore, right? As like these things, these like frivolous things for play. I think a lot of people don't think that games have these effects, whereas like you know, if, if you um, made a, a movie now that was like overtly racist or had these like really problematic tropes in it, like you'd get a lot of feedback, right? Like you'd get a lot of um, response to that, but it doesn't seem to be, um, people don't seem to be as critical of games because they think they're less serious in a way, which I think is a problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for thank coming. You all. Thank you all for